Lone Star Community Radio presents the Lone Star Radio Hour. For the next hour, you will hear locally produced radio plays from different groups around Montgomery County. If you're interested in the Lone Star Radio Hour and you want us to run one of your programs that you produced, just contact us uh, at lscrstudios at gmail.com. If you are interested in recording your own show here at the studio, uh, yeah, you can just contact us. And we're also looking for sponsorships for this time slot. So, uh, again, just contact us at uh, lscrstudios at gmail.com. You can also visit the Lone Star Radio Hour online at irlonestar.com slash lsrh. That's irlonestar.com slash lsrh. Uh, for all the plays on on-demand format. The following radio play you're about to hear is produced by the Players Theater Company in Conroe, Texas. For more information on the players, check them out online at www.owentheater.com slash players. Live from the studios of Lone Star Internet Radio, located in the Glittering Arts and Entertainment District in downtown Conroe, Texas, comes... The Players Theater Company, Old Time Radio Hour. This is your host, Dennis Nelson, wishing you a happy holiday and welcoming you to a very special episode of our series. The Players Theater Company and Lone Star Internet Radio are glad you could join us for this exceptional broadcast celebrating the Christmas season. Tonight's episode is presented by our major sponsor, A&H Electric. The Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, needs little introduction, but the Campbell Playhouse may not be as familiar. The Mercury Theater on the Air, an innovative series created by powerhouse actor, director, producer Orson Welles, brought exceptional and accessible dramatizations of the classics into homes across the country. Yet it struggled to keep an audience, or to find a sponsor. Following on the heels of the national hysteria surrounding the War of the Worlds radio broadcast and Wells' own instant stardom, the Mercury Theater found a friend in the Campbell Soup Company. Now with a sponsor, the series became the Campbell Playhouse, continuing the Mercury Theater mission of bringing intelligent and entertaining adaptations of classic plays and novels into American homes. Inevitably included in these prestigious broadcasts, A Christmas Carol became an annual holiday tradition, with listeners treated to Wells himself, or the legendary Lionel Barrymore as the iconic Ebenezer Scrooge. We're ready to create and recreate that radio spirit of Christmas past with you tonight. But before we start, let's introduce our gifted cast, most of which are appearing with the players and our radio series for the first time. Our narrator this evening, a role once held by Orson Welles, is a man of many talents, including acting, writing, and piano. We welcome none other than veteran performer Alan B. Berkowitz. We also welcome our Cratchits, the charismatic Kelly Strang as Bob Cratchit, and the magnificent Brianna Booth playing Mrs. Cratchit, both in our studio for the first time tonight. We've also assembled a cast of delightful Cratchit children, played tonight by Alyssa Skaggs, Aaliyah Willis, and Persephone Ozunian, with Kaylee Willis as Belinda Cratchit, and Moses Ozunian as young Master Peter Cratchit. The senior Cratchit sibling, Martha, will be played by the gifted Cassidy Perkins, whose players' credits include a role in Over the Tavern. Cassidy is instrumental in our players' kids' performances, having choreographed their production of The Aristocats, and even helping wrangle our children this evening. Haunting us tonight are the versatile True Lewis and the fantastic Marilyn Moore. True is new to our players' radio family, but Marilyn is a familiar sight at the Owen Theater stage, seen recently in Bus Stop, The Lion in Winter, and in The Matchmaker, for which she won a Monty Award. Both True and Marilyn are our Christmas ghosts tonight, but True is also playing the cherished role of Tiny Tim. 
Our cast is rounded out with debonair brothers Scott and Mark Altman, each playing multiple roles, but notably that of Jacob Marley and the Campbell's Playhouse announcer. The lyrical Nicole Zink, new to the players, will be our featured caroler. Overachieving talents Timothy Eggert and Belle Ledeen also join our cast this evening. Tim is pulling double duty for this episode as Scrooge's nephew Fred and as our series producer. Belle, in addition to appearing as her namesake and Scrooge's long-lost love, also directed tonight's episode. As if they didn't have enough to do. Get back to work, Dennis. Merry Christmas, Dennis. Merry Christmas to you, Belle. Since you were so nice, I'll mention your Monty nomination for last season's White Christmas at the Owen Theater. Aw, thank you very much. <coughs> Tim, 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 I know that you want me to mention your Monty nomination, but I'm ignoring you. Thanks a bunch. But I will even go so far as to mention a Monty nomination for tonight's musical director, Lori Shones, nominated for The Fantastics. Merry Christmas, Dennis. Oh, thank you so much. Finally, the coveted role of Ebenezer Scrooge will be played by the masterful Sean K. Thompson, a man of many talents, including acting, writing, directing. Sean was last heard in our series as the villain in our episode of The Shadow. We'll begin our play in just one moment, but first, an important message from our sponsor. trust your electrical service repair to just any company in Houston, Conroe, or the Woodlands. Rely on the experienced electricians at a and Electric to get the job done right the first time. When looking for the best local company for electrical service repair, call a and Electric. They handle emergency service, new wiring and construction, electrical maintenance, and troubleshooting. They specialize in service and installation and have a comprehensive knowledge of new and older technologies. Call a and Electric today at 936-756-0442. The makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse Orson Welles, producer. This is Orson Welles. There are clearly a number of ways in which a Christmas carol can be introduced. When Charles Dickens presented this little story to the world, it found an instant response in the hearts of people everywhere who saw in it their favorite fictional chronicle of what Christmas is and what Christmas means to all the simple people of the earth. From the day of its first printing, Families have been innumerable in which there has remained unbroken the tradition that the reading of a Christmas carol was an item indispensable to a proper observance of the most important of days. A Christmas carol, as Charles Dickens wrote it, has by common consent long been a classic. We get a great deal of pleasure planning and preparing this Christmas gift, and now it is ready. And so off come the wrappings, off come the tags that say, please do not open till Christmas. Come out the cards to you from us, and here is the gift itself. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of the burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it 
and Scrooge's name was good upon charge for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead, of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Ah, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge was. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve... Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim and cheerless place if there ever was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep an eye on his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who, in a cold and dismal little cell beyond, worked on his ledgers. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Was born on Christmas Day. Twenty-three, twenty-six, twenty-nine. Nine carry two. Astray. Uh, Eleven, thirteen, seventeen, seven. Bob Cratchit. Uh, yes, Mister Scrooge. Stop that infernal caterwauling. Yes, sir. Uh, nine. Fifteen, seventeen, twenty-one, carry the one. Uh, all the impudents singing their idiotic Christmas carols at my very door. Go away! Get away from my door! Aww. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols, or I'll give you charge. Sorry, Governor. It's an old custom at Christmas time, you know. Yes. And I don't want any of your old customs. Take your fellow fools and go away. Christmas? Blah. Right, sir. Merry Christmas anyway, sir. Blah. The king went to Slosser Town on the feast of Stephen. Now you get that letter from Higgins and Blackthorn, Cratchit. And then I want you to finish posting this ledger. And after that, you can pop over to Fothergill's and tell Heathrum Fothergill you've come after the 17 shillings and sixpence he's owed me since Michaelmas. And tell him I shall have a constable over there if he does not pay up at once. Uh, Mr. Fothergill's wife has been ill, sir. What do I care about his wife? I want my 17 and six. I, I, I just thought it being Christmas, sir. Christmas. Christmas. You mention that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I shall... Merry Christmas, Uncle! Merry Christmas, Bob! Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred! God save you, Uncle! Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Now I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? You're poor enough. Well, what right have you to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Ugh. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not one hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should just... <laughs> Uncle! Now, nephew, keep Christmas in your way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, let me leave it alone, then. What do you want? A Christmas gift, no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas! What good may Christmas do you? <laughs> what good has it ever done you? There are many things from which I derived good by which I have not profited materially, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, and therefore, Uncle, therefore, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it! God bless Christmas! Hurrah! Let me hear another sound out of you there, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Yes, sir. And as to you, nephew... I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Oh, don't be un angry, Uncle. I, I want nothing from you. 
I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I've tried. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year, too. Bah, and a Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and to the missus, and to Tiny Tim. Thank you, Mr. Hollowell. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Nonsense. Twaddle. Frammery. Talking of Christmas, and not two sixpences to jangle together in his trousers pocket. Hey there, you, Bob Cratchit. Come here. What are you doing there? Uh, I'm only putting a bit more coal in the fire, Mr. Scrooge, seeing it's so cold in there, sir. You put that coal back in the scuttle. A fire? A fire indeed. I can tell you, if you use coal at that rate, you and I shall soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? There's many a young fellow who would like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. Well then, put on your mittens. There's someone at the door. Go see who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is this the firm of Scrooge and Marley? Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. What is it? A uh, gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Eh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years. Tonight, I'm Scrooge. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this time of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities. <laughs> and hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Uh, are there no prisons? Well, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And workhouses, they're still in operation, I trust? I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and poor law are in full vigor, then. Both very busy, sir. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. No, sir. All these institutions that you mention are flourishing. But it's nevertheless true that some additional provisioning for the poor and destitute must be made. <sighs> a few of us, upon change, are endeavoring to raise such a fund, you see. And uh, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to remain anonymous. I wish to be left alone. I don't make myself merry Christmas time, and I can't afford to make a lot of idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir, and many would rather die. Well, then, my advice to them is to do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I've only your word for it that all this is so. It's the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Mm, so be it, then. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. I quite understand, Mr. Scrooge. Good afternoon. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, sir, please. Sir, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute tuppence. That's it! Yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others in worse situation than I. You're a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. That's it! Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Merry Christmas. That's it! Uh, uh, yes, sir. Close the door. Yes, sir. <sighs> 24, 31, 1 carry 3, new scarlet tippet for Tiny Tim, comb for Martha, 33, 3 carry 3, hair ribbon for Belinda, 4, 7, 12, 15... Uh, yes, sir? It's too late to have you go to Farfagill's. He'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up the place now. Uh, yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Hard to see the figures. I suppose you'll want the entire day off tomorrow. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair either. But I suppose I can't do anything about that. 
If I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself very ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir... Yes, I... but you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Once a year? Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. <sighs> I suppose there's no good talking. You must have the whole day. Well then, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. You understand? Oh, I will, sir. I will indeed. Good night, sir. Merry Christmas. Ah. Merry Christmas. Ah. The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Pratchett, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cobb Hill twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran down home to Camden Town as hard as he can pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went to the dismal house. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew it's every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Close the door. He locked himself in. He double locked himself in and took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. <laughs> Molly. Molly? Molly. I could have sworn I sold... Bah, humbug. Molly's been dead these seven years. Humbug. All humbug. What I need is a good night... What? what? What's that? Someone's in the wine cellar. But the door's locked and double locked. It... It's coming. Some, something is, is coming closer. Outside my door. Bah! I won't believe it. It's humbug still. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Huh? <gasps> Molly. What, what, what do you want of me? I want... Much of you, Ebenezer. Who are you? Ask me who I was. <laughs> You're very particular for a ghost. All right, then. Who were you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley? But you're dead. You died seven years ago. Seven years ago, this very night. <gasps> You're a ghost, then. What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? <laughs> yes. Because a little thing affects me. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You can't be a ghost. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There may be more of <laughs> gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Bleh. Humbug! I tell you, humbug! <coughs> ah, excuse me! Oh, excuse me, I do believe in you! You are a ghost, Jacob! Thank you. But why are you... Why do you walk the earth, Jacob? Why, why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, 
and turn to happiness. But tell me, Jacob, what is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Cash boxes? Keys and padlocks? Ledgers and purses? Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since, Ebenezer. Ah, oh, Jacob. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. Comfort I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You travel fast. Yes, Ebenezer. On the wings of the wind. Seven years dead and traveling all the time. Seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years of remorse. Ebenezer. Do you know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused? But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. No, Jacob, Jacob, don't take on now so, Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. I'm listening to you, Jacob. Go on now, Jacob. Speak to me. Just don't be so flattery. Ebenezer, I am here to warn you that you have yet of a chance of hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear that, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob. You... you always were a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. But go on. Go go on. Go on. How, how shall I escape? Or... Oh. I am afraid, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the only chance and hope, Jacob? It is your only chance and hope. Well, then I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Ebenezer! Look but for your own sake, you'll remember what has passed between us. And remember, when the bell tolls one, look for the first spirit. Marley! Jacob Marley! We will return to our Campbell Playhouse production of A Christmas Carol after a brief pause with an important message from our sponsor. Ring in the new year with the Players Theatre Company. Enjoy a groovy New Year's evening of dining, live music, and dancing with the Owen Theatre. The Players Theatre Company New Year's celebration will feature a catered dinner and music from the Eagles tribute band Already Gone and the Beatles tribute band Abbey Road. Reserve your tickets today by going to owentheatre.com. That's O W E N. T-H-E-A-T-R-E dot com. Welcome 2014 right with the Players Theatre Company. <laughs> and now, back to the Campbell Playhouse and our presentation of A Christmas Carol. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed, fully dressed. Suddenly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you, and I'm standing in the spirit at his elbow. It was strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle on it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Ebenezer Scrooge. Who's that? Ebenezer Scrooge. I have come for you. Oh, you are... Oh. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold me? 
I am that spirit. <laughs> what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Beneath Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Uh, no, 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 not out the window. I can't do that. I'll, I'll fall down. I'm not a spirit. I'm mortal and I'll fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. But where are we? What's become of the city? There's, there's snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of the things that have been. Do you recognize this countryside? I know every inch of it. Every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there? Oh, that building. <laughs> I was a boy there. Yes. I went to that school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? <laughs> I could walk it blindfolded. Strange you should forget it so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes! Yes, I see. I know that boy. Oh, I was so lonely. Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge, and what is that on your cheek? It's nothing. Nothing at all. I wish... Uh, ah, it's too late now. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. The waifs came to my door singing Christmas carols last night, and there was a boy like that among them. A poor, pale, thin little boy in ragged coat. I should like to have given him something, that's all. Is that all? Come, Ebenezer Scrooge, let us see another Christmas. Do you know this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? <laughs> know it? Know it? <laughs> Why, this is the old counting house where I was apprenticed. Listen! Ha, look, it's my old master! Bless his heart, old Fezziwig! My master, alive again, and host of one of his Christmas parties. <laughs> oh, listen to him. Hold hands with your partner. Bow and face away. Corkscrew, thread the needle, and back to your places. And look, there's Dick Wilkins. Poor Dick. Ah, oh, dear, dear, dear. Yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself, looking younger than any of them. All the tables all loaded with roast and cider and mince pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man with the light heart and a gay smile, do you recognize him? Yes, 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 merciful heaven. How happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly folks so full of joy. Small matter? Small indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves praise? Nah, it's not that. It's not that spirit. <laughs> Old Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy. To make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words and looks. And in things so tiny it's impossible to count them up. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a... a uh, what is the matter? Nothing, nothing at all, spirit. Something, I think. No, no. Speak. Well, only... It's just that I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, that's all. Swing to your partner. Address the entire. Bow and curtsy. Thread the needle. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. Um. 
This is our last visit to the past, Ebenezer. Here, in this little room, with a fair young girl by your side, do you recognize yourself as Ebenezer? No. No, 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 no! Spare me this! You're older now, a man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to weather signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy, and the eager, restless eyes of a miser. No. No, no, please! She knows it, too. That girl by your side, there are tears in her eyes. It matters little, Ebenezer, to you. Very little, I know that. Belle, have I changed towards you? When we were engaged, you, we were both poor. Was it better then? Better to be poor? Better to at least be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. You blame me because I've grown wiser. Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words, no. In what Never. then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So it was the full heart that I release you from your promise. Belle. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim. Like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer. For the love of the man you once were. enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These were the shadows of things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. No. No more. No more. One shadow more. Come. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you. And the woman beside him, your wife, and that girl. That girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. Belle, I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Oh... I know. Mr. Scrooge. Mm. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered. There was a candle inside, so I couldn't help but see him. His partner Marley lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat, all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit. Spirit, I can't bear any more. Leave me. Haunt me no more. Take me back. Take me back. You're listening to the Campbell Playhouse, bringing to you tonight our presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, produced by Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Are you looking for a unique way to promote your local business and support the arts at the same time? If your answer is yes, then you have a groundbreaking opportunity right now to tell the world about your business. Promote yourself and the arts in Conroe by advertising on this very program. Imagine your company's name mentioned here in a radio spot, complete with actors, music, and sound effects. We reach not only Conroe, Montgomery County, and Texas, but many countries worldwide. The advertising contained in this program airs not only once, but several times, and then is included with the archive program for on-demand listening. Rates are much less than you might expect, so contact Dick Schisler, General Manager at Lone Star Internet Radio for more details. Call today at 832-335-9646 or send an email to dick at irlonestar.com. Don't wait. Claim your radio spot and get the word out about your business today. Now, back to the Campbell Playhouse and our presentation of A Christmas Carol. Oh. 
On the stroke of one, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the next specter would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not, by any means, prepared for nothing. And consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then, as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light. It seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultries, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pie, plum pudding, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, ma. You, you're a... Um... I am the ghost of Christmas present. Oh, look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before? You're... you're different from the other spirits. You're, you're tall, almost a giant. And that great torch you carry... Its light falls into the homes of rich and poor alike. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learned a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe. What have you brought me, spirit? A humble dwelling on a humble street. <laughs> it's miserable enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who, who are those people? Who's that woman and the children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. Oh, See his wife dressed in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, lay the table for their Christmas dinner, and they're assisting her. Oh, it's their daughter, Belinda, and the young man with the fork in the stuffing. That's Master Peter Cratchit. Oh, and the two little Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. Here's Martha, Mother. Here's Martha, Mother, hurrah! Aye, Martha, aye, Michael. Children, children! <laughs> Why, bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas Mother. Mother. Merry Christmas. Well, my goodness, how late you are, my dear. Oh, we'd a deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, so long as you're here now. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless you. Where's Father? Oh, he's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. Oh, how is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Well, sometimes I think he is, and, and sometimes I think... Oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim. Mother, you mustn't even think, that, think of such a thing. Here they come, Father and Tiny Tim. Oh, I'm going to Tiny Tim. And there's Tiny Tim. Oh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father and Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Let me take your coat off, Tim. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're so glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church today, Bob? Oh, as good as gold and better. No. I like church, Mother. 
How have they sang the nicest songs? I hope people saw me there. Well, saw you there? And why, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crotch, it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bless you, my son. Mother, are we ready to eat? Oh, come on, let's eat. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, children, we're all ready. Come, take your places now and uh, wait your turn. There's plenty of stuffing, dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Mother, take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. And see that he eats plenty. He must get strong and well. Uh, sit down, sit down, everyone. And now, my dears, shall we say grace? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. No, 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 kind spirit. Say he'll be spared. Say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, Ebenezer, the child will die. Amen. Amen. And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. God bless us, everyone. And now to Mr. Scrooge. Amen. I give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, who pays you all 15 shillings a week. If I, I wish I had him here, I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on and hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, but not for his. Well, I'd like to a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I'm sure. And I say, God bless him to Mother and everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof, their clothes were scanty, and had known very likely the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went to labor in the bowels of the earth and out to sea among the sailors at their watch, dark ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw and far they went and many places they visited but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful, on foreign lands and they were close at home, by poverty and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital and jail, where vain man and his very brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, the spirit left its blessing. It was a long night, if it was only a night, and it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight, at, at midnight. Hark, the hours come. No, 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 not yet, not yet. There are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from still another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer.
Scrooge looked about him for the ghost that had vanished and found himself once more in his bed in his dressing gown and in his nightcap on his head. He heard the clock strike. And then he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifted up his eyes and beheld the third spirit. The solemn phantom shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming towards him slowly and silently, like a mist among the ground. I know you. You, you are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You'll show me shadows of the things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. Yet I know your purpose is to do me good, as I hope to live to be another man from what I was. Lead on, lead on. The night's waning fast, and time is precious to me. Spirit, why have you brought me here again? Here to Bob Cratchit's home, but... It's not the same. Why? Why is it so quiet? So very quiet here. Mother, Mother, please. My son. My little son, Tiny Tim. I loved him so. Oh, Mother dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for Father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yes, yes, Martha. He's late tonight. He walks slower than he used to. And yet I've known him to walk very fast indeed with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. Oh, so have I, Mother. Oh, but he was light to carry it. His father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. Oh, Bob. Good evening, my dear. (laughs) Oh, you're late, Bob. Yes, I'm sorry, my dear. I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It, It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. Yes, I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk there on a Sunday. Oh, Father dear. It's God's will, Bob. I'm trying to understand it, my dear. My son, my little son, Tiny Tim, and I loved him so. Oh, that's cruel. Cruel. Spirit, can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that, that Tiny Tim may live? Where are you taking me now? Here on a common street, spirit? What is there for me to learn here? Who are those men? I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. It's likely to be a cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if lunch is provided. (laughs) (laughs) Come to think of it, I'll bet I was his best friend. What? We used to nod to each other when we met in the street. (laughs) Spirit, tell me, uh, who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn the poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps they'll give him a green grave at least, like poor Tiny Tim. Perhaps... Spirit, where are we now? Merciful heaven, a churchyard overrun by grass and weeds, choked up with too much burying, desolate, lonely, crumbling gravestone. Spirit, before I draw nearer to that gravestone, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only, eh? Would you not speak to me, Spirit? What is that grave to which you point? There's writing on that stone. And the name on the gravestone is... Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge? Oh, no! No, spirit, no! Hear me! I am not the man I was! Why show me this if I have passed all hope? Tell me that I can change these dreadful shadows you have shown me by an altered life! I will honor Christmas in my heart. I'll try to keep it all the year. I'll live in the past and the present and the future. And I'll not shut off the lessons that they teach. 
Oh, tell me, spirit, go on, tell me. Tell me I can sponge away the writing on that stone, spirit. I beg you, spirit. I beg you. Spirit, I promise. I promise on my knees. I, I promise. I, I... What? What's this? It's my own bedpost. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> in my own bed, in my own room. And the sun. Oh, the sun's shining. It's clear, it's bright, no clouds. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious, glorious. Hey, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, yes, sir. What, what's today? What's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. <laughs> Christmas Day? Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night, heaven be praised. How's that, sir? Listen, my lad. Do you know where the poulterer is, the one in the next street? I should say I do. Ha! <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Tell me, do you know if they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, sir. Oh, that's wonderful. Go around, will you, and tell them to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Camden Road. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry, hurry, my lad. Uh, here, oh, wait, wait a minute. Here's half a crown for your trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas, sir. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm, li I'm light as a feather. I'm happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Merry Christmas. M merry Christmas to everybody. Happy New Year to all the world. <laughs> Oh, my dear sir, how do you do? I, I beg your pardon? You, sir. Aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regard to the charity? Why, why yes, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. Uh, yes, sir. Allow me to ask your pardon, sir. Will, will you have the goodness to accept, um, I prefer to whisper this. Why, 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 Lord bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please. Now, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. <laughs> Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, I do not know what to say to such munificence. Ah, don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will. I will indeed. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I, I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Merry Christmas! Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it, yes he did. The clock struck one, nine. No, Bob. A quarter past. No, Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came in, his hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was at his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Eight, fifteen, and twenty-one. Six, carry the one. Twenty-four, carry the two. Thirty-one, eight, and nine. Hello, you, Cratchit. Yes, sir? Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes. Yes, I think you are. It's it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand for this sort of thing any longer. Oh, no. And therefore, no, no, Bob please, Cratchit, please, no, Mr. Scrooge, I no, please, am about please, to no, 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 raise please, no, your please, no, salary! No, no, Mr. Scrooge, 
Are you quite yourself, sir? No. <laughs> no, thank heaven. I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fellow, and a merrier Christmas than I have given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary. And then we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family, eh? We'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up the fire. Make it up and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. It was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough, in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and a little heeded them. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us during our first holiday episode of the Players Theatre Company Old Time Radio Hour. We hope you enjoyed it just as much as we enjoyed making it for you. Tonight's technical credits go to Dick Schistler, sound engineer and producer for Lone Star Internet Radio. Our assistant director was Donna Field. Sound effects were performed live and from scratch without the use of recordings by Vanessa Lee and Radina Bars. Our music this evening was improvised and performed by Laurie Shones. Commercial announcers included Mark Altman, Nicole Zink, Kelly Strang, Brianna Booth, and Cassidy Perkins. Now playing at the Owen Theater through December 21st, rush to see our holiday classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Also, get your tickets now for the sequel to a fan favorite, Nonsense 2, The Second Coming, opening January 24th. The riveting Inherit the Wind follows in spring 2014. More details on tickets and our 2013-2014 season can be found at owentheater.com. Once again, the website is owentheater.com. Special thanks also go to Kathy Cook, owner of the Gallery Off the Square in downtown Conroe, for the use of her space for rehearsal purposes. Be sure to stop by her gallery, which is located at 202 North Main in Conroe, Texas, and view breathtaking classic American and Thomas Kincaid artwork, and enjoy refreshments in Chelsea's Tea Room. Tell her that you heard about the gallery on the Players Theatre Company Old Time Radio Hour. Also visit her online at galleryoffthesquare.net. Tonight's impressive Christmas cast included Alan B. Berkowitz as Orson Welles, Kelly Strang as Bob Cratchit, Brianna Booth as Mrs. Cratchit. Featured as the Cratchit children were Alyssa Skaggs, Aaliyah Willis, and Persephone Ozunian with Kaylee Willis as Belinda Cratchit, Moses Azunian as Peter Cratchit, and Cassidy Perkins as Martha Cratchit. Also featured on our cast were True Lewis as the ghost of Christmas past and as Tiny Tim, Marilyn Moore as the ghost of Christmas present, Timothy Eggert as Fred Hollowell, Belle Ledeen as Belle, 
Nicole Zink as the caroler, Scott Altman as Jacob Marley, and Mark Altman as the charity collector and as the Campbell's Playhouse announcer, and Sean K. Thompson as Ebenezer Scrooge. Tonight's episode was directed by Belle Ledeen. Series producer on behalf of the Players Theatre Company was Timothy Eggert. The Players Theatre Company Old Time Radio Hour was created by Craig Campobella and Dick Schistler, exclusively for the Players Theatre Company. This episode of the Players Company Old Time Radio Hour was performed live on Lone Star Internet Radio in Conroe, Texas on December 14, 2013 and was recorded for Encore Broadcasts. Visit IRLoneStar.com every month for freshly archived episodes, like last month's episode of The Life of Riley, now available on demand for your listening pleasure. Our next live radio production will be an episode from Academy Award Theater featuring the classic story The Maltese Falcon on Saturday, January 18th at 7 p.m. Thank you so very much for joining us. May your days be merry and bright this holiday season. From the Glittering Art District of Conroe, Texas, this is your host, Dennis Nelson, wishing you a very pleasant evening, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. Thanks for listening to Lone Star Radio Hour here on Lone Star Community Radio. Don't forget, the Lone Star Radio Hour airs every Sunday at 7 p.m. on IRLoneStar.com and Conroe's FM 104.5-106.1. If you want to join and be part of the Lone Star Radio Hour with your own radio play, contact us today at lscrstudios at gmail.com. We are also looking for support for this time slot, so if you're interested in sponsoring this time slot, Contact us again at lscrstudios at gmail.com. And don't forget, this radio play was brought to you by the Players Theater Company in Conroe, Texas. For more information about the players, please check them out online at owentheater.com players.